All right, welcome to Real Monsters. I'm your host, S.K. Barrett, and I'm here with Wes Hobrick. How's it going? Hello, one and all. Oops, I better turn that off. I am getting an echo here. Oh. Mute the stream. There we go. <laughs> Much better. Yeah. How you doing? Oh, just dandy. How are you? Ah, great. I had a little nap right before yeah. the show. <laughs> I wasn't planning it. <laughs> oh, that's good. I was trying to get one, but gave up after a little while, so. A little it dinner, a little wine, a little nodding off, and I, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, God, I just, I realized, you know, we could have, I could have totally slept through the whole show. Yeah. <laughs> <And> had... <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, you deserved a nap, man. We, Definitely. We are going to talk about a very strange man tonight. Very, very strange. I think the quote that I put in the chat from Psycho really sums him up. It was, a boy's best friend is his mother. We are talking about the ghoul of Plainfield himself, Eddie Gein. Yeah. Um, I mean, he's, a, he's a killer who is very foundational in terms of American killers, too. Check out Some... this quote from him. <laughs> Do you know what Ed Gein said about women? <laughs> it kind of reminds me of that coffee cup. Right. <laughs> I like my women like I like my coffee, ground up. Ed Gein. If only he had that level of wit. Yeah. Um, not only was he prolific, and I'm, I don't even know, they don't even know how many people he killed right Not you know sure. th they really don't there's two that are a definite but the problem that you get in into with Gein was that before he was killing he was extensively robbing and looting graves all ah. over wisconsin ah so that that muddies the water it definitely does and that's something we'll get into here a little bit later is all the various uses he found for the people that he harvested or killed. Um, stuff that really kind of rivals what Mengele and the Nazis did to people in concentration camps during the Second World War. Wow. Uh, you know, he's also foundational, though, for another um, reason, and that is that he was undoubtedly one of the most pro the most prolific serial killer influence on the horror movie right in american history yeah he has been uh represented as himself mm -hmm. and as an inspiration for other uh i don't know uh characters characters in horror films absolutely you know the one that they made about him i didn't like because the guy that they used as the main star was big and burly and gein was ed anything but he was a diminutive little man really right. Right. he was tiny but there we have another influence norman bates much more uh, his phys physique yeah Although not his age, much younger than right. Gene. Right, right. Um, but you get into others that he was the influence behind. Um, Leatherface in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And um, Toby Hooper, it's interesting with that, actually remembered hearing tales of this weird farmer um, who would harvest bodies and kill people in order to make all these weird things from it when he was um, going to Wisconsin to visit relatives as a kid. And it basically scarred him for a very long time and was, I think, subconsciously the uh, motivator for Leatherface. 
Really? In Texas Chainsaw. Yeah. And he really didn't realize how prolific Gein was as an influence there until after the fact. But there's a picture of um, Buffalo Bill, Silence of the Lambs. Yep. He, was a, he was probably the most accurate in terms of psychology when you're looking at it. Because he wanted to he wanted become to a make, woman. Right, he, wanted to, he was making the suit. Right, exactly. And that was Gein as well. But, you know, one thing that really I question with him is not whether he was wanting to become a woman, but whether he wanted to be a specific woman. And that was his mother after she died. And segueing there, it would behoove us to start talking a bit about his childhood, which um, he was born in 1906 in Wisconsin to a father who was essentially an alcoholic dish rag. His wife would literally walk all over him. And he would also beat his two sons, Ed and Henry, regularly. Um, but his wife, Augusta, was a very religious woman, very devout, very fundamentalist and strict. And she essentially beat into both her kids to some degree, but Ed more so. The idea that sex, no matter what it is or how it is, is always reprehensible. Uh. And that men are devils. Not women, that men are devils. Right. So, but it's weird because she did not have her fixation um, on Henry like she did on Ed. And I think that was something that really echoed for Gein across the years, especially with his brother, because it was around 1944 when Ed and Henry were fighting a brush fire on their farm in Plainfield, Wisconsin, when um, Henry mysteriously died. They found him face down in the middle of the fire, and the official cause of death was asphyxiation from the smoke. But then there's other reports that say there was marks of a blunt object that had hit him in the head. So a lot of people question whether this wasn't Ed's first kill. Hmm. How old was Ed at the time? That would be, he would have been 38, 37, 38. That's really late start, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it really is. And that's where it gets into the other outliers that Gein is, because I would argue he didn't obviously kill for the sexual component in the way that a Ted Bundy did. Hmm. Yeah. You know, Killing was almost incidental to what he was doing. And that was trying to make a woman's suit to bring his mother back after she died a year after Henry in 1945. Is that his real... Oh, sorry, go ahead. He (laughs) He isn't suspected of killing her? He is not suspected of killing Augusta. She actually died after two strokes. I see. The first one she um, came back from, but then the second one she just didn't. Um, And Ed was taking care of her throughout much of her last days. But, yeah, he is very much suspected of killing Henry, but not Augusta. Um, And it's interesting. After she died is when you started to see a real degradation in Gein's psyche and his personality. And what he did was, at the farmhouse, he walled off her room and five other rooms where she always was, and basically lived in one room and the kitchen. And it became wow. ever more ever more squalid and just horrible. Right. Um, Her- Harold Schechter, the true crime author, wrote in his book on Gein that the Gein homestead out there was what he called a factory for madness. <laughs> well, I think it's and, a very apt with, description with one customer <laughs> <laughs> basically there is Augusta on the screen yeah, but yeah. and after Gein would be um, arrested for the murders that we know he committed the two murders 
and would later confess to the grave robbing, um, psychologists did diagnose him as a schizophrenic. Oh, really? Mm hmm. And that's one thing that you don't see with a whole lot of these monsters that we're studying, which really, is, at all. Which is odd, you know? You, you, you might think um, that would be more prevalent. Absolutely. And you would think so. But it's very rare that they would have a genuine thought disorder. Right. In the mode of schizophrenia. But. Yeah, after Augusta died in 1945, he started going downhill. He started reading um, pornographic magazines, uh, pulp novels from back in the day, because this was 1945 when she died. And um, also a lot of medical books and a lot of histories of the Second World War, of what was known then. And it was through reading a lot of this that he learned how to do things like tan leather, and he applied that to skin. Whoa. Yeah. Of the people that he would kill. Um, and that's where you see all these weird things that he made, like um, a lamp shade made out of human skin, a chair upholstered with human skin, um, a belt a made of belt. nipples. Yeah, a, a belt. Uh, wasn't there a necklace? There was. Yeah, some of that stuff's going to start showing up in the slideshow. Uh, a lampshade made out of women's lips, upper lips. What Gein would do with the genitalia that he would steal in his grave robberies and with the murders that we know he committed, he would basically disattach it and put it in a pair of panties and wear it around the homestead. Wow. Yeah. Wow, <laughs> that's just uh, yeah. So what we see here is a cauldron that he used to use mm -hmm. for what well, rendering, I guess. I believe so. Is that the one that Zach Bagans of Ghost Adventures bought? Yeah, I know he. It's, it's in yeah. The, yeah, it's in the museum. And right there, right now is um, Bernice Ward and the the hardware store owner, ah. widow Bernice Warden from Plainfield, after he killed her. And he he hung her upside down and almost bisected her body. Basically, he gutted her in the way that the men up in that part of Wisconsin would gut a deer right. that they would catch. And in fact, the whole reason that Gein was even able to get her on her own was because all the men of the town were out on the yearly deer hunt. So, so he, what do we know about this story and why was she a victim and how did this all uh, happen? Likely she was marinating in Ed's brain for some time because she did have a bit of a resemblance to Augusta. Ah. And she was also around Augusta's age when she died. Um, but Ed went in there with his rifle and with a can of antifreeze. He was going to buy some to um, ref refill that. And then he was going to try to sell his rifle to the store was his cover. But he goes in there, he shoots her, right drags in her, her right off. In, right in her store? Right in her store. Wow. But this, again, is when basically all the men in town are gone you know, out on the deer hunt. But it wasn't long after that when her um, son showed up, saw the blood around the register, knew something was wrong, and he tells the sheriff, Art um, Schley, that it was that weirdo Eddie Gein who did something to her. And he, what did he base that on? Just because he was, like, one of the few men around? That could be part of it, but I, you know, I also wonder if they didn't have some idea of what was happening. Although up until um, Bernice Warden and the other victim, Mary Hogan's murders, they would, the people of Plainfield would have Gein over as like a babysitter or to do odd jobs. 
they knew he was weird, but they thought that he was basically harmless. Uh, they called it. They called him the weird little bachelor. In fact, wow. So, but yeah, I mean, the, his her son got to the store. They found a, a scene that was there, and they rallied the forces, and the cavalry went out to the Gein homestead. And, and that's, that's when they went through it. Wow. And it, the site in there got Sheriff Schley so disturbed, he literally ran outside and was puking his guts out from that. Yeah, I, I, think, <laughs> I, I think I heard that several of the policemen were, were traumatized for life based on what things that they saw in the house. Yeah, more than a few definitely were, but... And that's when they found everything there. They take Ed into custody, and it snowballs from there. He gets put into two mental hospitals over the remaining course of his life. So, but there on the screen, we have one of the masks that he made. Right. Literally from skinning a corpse. Hair and all. Yep. He would also often put lipstick on him. And he would wear them around the house. And here's the nipple belt. Mm hmm I mean, Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, come on. Absolutely. It's... Okay, so schizophrenia. So, so he probably wasn't a psychopath as much as a schizophrenic. Yeah. And, and that, you know, that's the kind of thing that usually uh, begins to manifest like in your 20s, right? Or yeah. Teens typically. or 20s. Typically, it's, typically, yeah. It's not something that typically starts to show up when you, in your mid-30s and later. Yeah, it usually doesn't, although I wonder in this case if that wasn't mainly because of Augusta's death, essentially causing something akin to a psychotic break in game. Yeah. I mean, that would be a theory. Because you have to remember, you really can't overstate just how close their relationship was. In fact, Henry, while he was still alive was trying to communicate to his brother just how weird it was, how close oh. they were. Really? Yeah. Yeah, and that idea really shook Ed up, and maybe, maybe it's why he killed him, if he did. Man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. And he never had any of uh, any kind of a relationship with anybody else, right? You know, it's funny. He was really the first American serial killer to get a lot of fan mail, and there was one who claimed to be Gein's girlfriend for the past twenty years. So basically, from nineteen thirty-eight onward, but that claim was later retracted. <laughs> yeah. So, Wait, yeah, ladies, come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you could do better than him. You can do better than the cannibal, although, you know, it's interesting. He has he had always denied ever having relations with the dead bodies, yeah. although the although the bodies he would pillage from the cemeteries were basically exclusively women. He n never admitted to having relations with any of them, and there's honestly no um, evidence to suggest that he did. Well, I mean, the, uh, you know, the brainwashing that, that sex is always bad, and, mm -hmm. and his, um, you know, devotion, if you will, to his mother, that, that, that could be, that could really explain that, that you know. So, so, the, so the, the thing that happens to everyone growing up 
is your whatever environment you're in and all of the different elements that as a child you when you're growing up you either accept those or you reject them yeah and oh absolutely um some people take those kinds of instructions and they reject them outright and they go completely the other direction but he seems to have you know really Mm -hmm. completely bought into that yeah and he definitely did. It became, in a lot of ways, a part of him. But it is the Gein Homestead, after he was caught in 1957, and the full extent of the horrors was starting to be uncovered, they were going to um, auction the house and the homestead. But before they could do that, it burned down under very mysterious circumstances. Not sure if it was arson or just, you know, like a lightning that did it. But the house is no longer there. Although an interesting thing about that auction, there was a carny who bought Gein's car and oh. charged 25 cents a head for tours, taking it really? around the country. Yeah. So. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Uh... I've got the the news clips um, slideshow going, and and in here we'll have the uh, there's a the notice for the auction. Yep, so that'll be coming up here in a bit. Just goes to show, even going back to the 1950s, the American public had this fascination with this sort of thing. Right. Well, there had already been, you know, H. H. Holmes. And Jack the Ripper had made headlines here. Um, Yeah, absolutely. But they also didn't have TV during either of those. There was no, you know, mass media. Just newspapers. Right. 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 But with Gein, we're talking about the era of television starting to come into its own. Radio, definitely. Yep, radio too, having been around. And that's another part of what makes Gein, you know, so foundational, not just the horror movies. What's that? He was was really the first serial killer to happen during the modern mass media age. Gotcha. First one to kind of become a household name during that. And, yeah, uh celebrity killer i guess yeah yeah you could definitely say that you know it's interesting too after they put him into those hospitals in wisconsin um i don't know if people noticed how gaunt he looked in those other pictures that we were showing Mm -hmm. but he started to put on a healthy weight and actually seem more balanced when he was in the hospital well, he was probably getting meds, right? To... Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. But I think also the um, structure of it might have been helpful to mm. him. You know, after living for so long without his mother, living right. in squalor. Um, and... Right. Yeah. Like, uh, he, he wasn't good at self-care. Yeah. And like a lot of, you know, people who are in deep mental illness, he would ignore it. Right. So. It, so, so. So he gets, he gets arrested. Mm-hmm. Um, for, for. Uh, the warden killing, right? Yep. Um, and who was the other? You said that he was arrested. He was tried and convicted for two killings. That would be Mary Hogan was the other one. She was a um, bar owner in um, Plainfield and who also looked like Augusta. And it, she was the one who had gone missing for a while before um, he killed Bernice Warden. 
and they really didn't know until they found her head in a plastic oh. bag. Oh, was it a plastic? It wasn't the one. Or that a, in a paper in a box? bag. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, her head in a paper bag. There were. She was there being were a few prepared heads around, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. There was a few, and she, he was preparing her head to be hung on the wall with other trophies he had, other heads. That is, he kept his trophies. Wow. Mm hmm. And Most definitely. <laughs> I mean, you know, in in the modern parlance of uh, you know profiling, um, the concept of trophies is is well known, but it's usually tokens, mm -hmm. <laughs> not yeah. an actual head on the w fucking wall. Oh yeah, exactly. You know, Gein really used most every part of the bodies that he took. You know, including storing the organs. In fact, there was a heart on a dinner plate in his place when they were in there. Oh, right. So, yeah, the cannibalism. Mm-hmm. Right? Definitely. And that... Um, uh, that's brings it... Uh, how interesting is it that he is kind of the um, inspiration for Buffalo Bill and Hannibal Lecter? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he really was. For both sides, um, elements of both of their pathologies in that movie. But, yeah, I mean, he would have been way far from being articulate in any way, shape, or form. Right, right. He was but, he was poorly educated. Yeah. Uh, mentally not, you know, the brightest. Yeah. Um, and definitely although at the time there was a lot of people who were wondering if he wasn't a um ruthlessly smart psychopath. The people of Plainfield did not want him to be found crazy. Uh, well, no, that <laughs> people, people rarely are. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, they wanted him to get full punishment for what he did, whether or not he, you know, was mentally ill or sane. So. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. So he was, he was a cannibal like uh, at, at which it kind of inspired Lecter, but who was not mm -hmm. otherwise <laughs> like Hannibal Lecter. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he, not otherwise. Because he, he worked as, what, a house painter most of his life. If, mm -hmm. Is that, that's, if I'm remembering right. He was just yeah. a, hand, yeah, handyman guy. He was just a handyman Yeah, guy. Yeah, part of the odd jobs that he was hired around. Um, playing field to do mm -hmm. handymen and the like. Although it, a lot of the women in playing field had always felt kind of uneasy around Gein. So maybe they did sense something, but they would describe quite often how he would be looking at them, um, staring at him really with his lazy eye hmm. and other things. But other than that, there didn't really seem to be much of a idea that he would be capable of anything even approaching this. Well, I mean, nobody thought anybody was capable of this, right? Yeah, well, perhaps not. I mean, that's, a, that's another thing, too. You know, it was the 50s. It was a golden time by a lot of accounts where, you know, people were thinking, oh, we had the horror of World War II behind us. Mm -hmm. Life is good now. You know, we're not going to have to see unthinkable horrors ever again. It was a time of optimism. Right. And those horrors were associated with more with war than just, you know. Yeah. Than know. a psychopathic little farmer and... Right. Wisconsin. Yeah. So, 
you know, maybe that's part of why he sticks in the psyche so much. Not just the nature of the stuff that he did, but when he didn't. When it was brought to light. True. You know, one of the one of the things that I, I you know, I've I've read quite and st- studied quite a bit of World War II, and you know, people, especially the soldiers, you know, they really wanted all of that shit to be done with forever for the rest of their life. And, not, and you, there's mm-hmm. no, you don't, you can't blame them for that. It, oh yeah. Uh, War is not a, a lovely thing. Um, no, not at all. And so I could, I could really see, you know, even in a little town and, and I mean, by little, I mean, tiny town. Mm-hmm. Here, I'm going to put the map up again. So you get an idea what the, um, <laughs> geography's yeah. like it's a tiny town, just a few streets, and the rest is farms. And you know, there probably were dozens of uh, veterans of World War II just in that town. Oh, absolutely. There was what, maybe 800 people at that time yeah. was the population. And so, and so to have something like this, you know, discovered. And that would really, I could, I could totally see how that would be extremely uh, disturbing to their, the peace that they were hoping to, to experience for the rest of their lives. You know. Oh, absolutely. And putting their town on the map in all the wrong ways too. Right. You know. It's literally. Plainfield sits in an area of Wisconsin that is known as the state's great dead heart. <laughs> what does that mean? I mean, literally, literally, it was known that way before Gein, but there's essentially nothing there. It's just flat land. You know, just farm fields and really nothing else there. So that's where the name comes from. Yeah, uh, it really... <laughs> There's, you have to go miles to find any other town even yep. that, that even has a name, much less a name that anybody, you know, would recognize. Yeah, I mean, this is central Wisconsin. You know, there's not going to be a lot there. You know, there's not going to be a Milwaukee. You got to go to the south. Even uh, Madison is to the south of Plainfield. Yeah, and you know, there's old Green Bay up there. Stupid Packers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even sure if they were around at that time. What year did the Packers start? Oh, they started way back in the 30s. Oh, okay. Yeah, I apologize oh, to any Packers fans listening. I'm not up on their history. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> not that I don't like the team. The team's fine, but is it though? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah uh, vikings fans won't want to hear me saying that but you know what's um it, you know if becky was on she could attest to this um, uh, she is in the chat i believe but you know you you look at the at the these little towns out here and it's not a it's just fuck all to do besides work <laughs> and yeah besides work or go get drunk somewhere yeah on um, a side road i mean what else is there there's nothing well evidently rob graves and kill people if you're into that <laughs> but... <laughs> uh, you know yeah I, yeah i'm i mean my my folks are from eastern Idaho, from uh-huh. spud farming t- country, and uh, you know, yeah. So I know what that's like. You know, the you know it's it's a twenty minute walk just to get to the general store. Yep. And you're, yep, I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I went to high school in a town of about six hundred, so. I know how it is too. Yeah, 
so. <laughs> cow tipping, I guess, is a real thing. <laughs> <laughs> yep. That and getting drunk in a cornfield. Essential he it. Well, you know, everybody needs a hobby, and Ed like to skin people and cavort around his farm wearing it but that is really i think the strangest thing there did he want to become a woman because he hated men so because that's what his mother taught or did he want to become his mother hmm. after she died do we, do we did anybody ever really interview him there wasn't any um, allowed in the way of press interviews for most of it because the staff of these two hospitals he was in kept him closed off. He didn't receive a single visitor in the years yeah. he was there. And he was there from 1957 roughly till 1984 when he died. Man. Yeah. And... and... So, so we did, nobody had a chance to really dig into his psychology, like you know the Bundy tapes, for example, mm -hmm. and um, um, oh, what's his name that was on, on Mind Hunters? Um, oh, um, oh yeah, man, what is his name? The wasn't he also an Ed? Yeah, Ed, man, that. I should know this off the top of my head, but I'm blanking on that. Ed Kemper. Edmund Kemper. Yeah. Um, yeah, they really picked their brains. Right. I, I don't think it had even occurred to people to to try that at the in those days. Oh, I'm sure that you had quite a few psychologists who, and shrinks in there who were studying him, but yeah, nobody in the um, private sector, no journalists, or anything like that were allowed to interview him. They just, um, when they were moving him from hospitals, because he sat in the first one for, I think it was a few years before he was judged sane for a trial. Yeah. So they tried him with that, and they found him guilty, but then they found him insane at the same time. So technically, not guilty by reason of insanity was the final verdict. Well, let's, and then let's, they put him into another one. Let's talk about that trial. What do we know about the? Tr was it a long trial? Um, did get a lot? I mean, did it get a lot of press attention? Must have. You, you know, it did, but it wasn't that long. And I wish I would have written down how long it was when I saw it, but. I think it had become unequivocal to a lot of people then that he was just batshit crazy. Even if he um, looked somewhat normal when they brought him out of the hospital, because he was shaven and, you know, he had gained some weight because he's eating. Um, so even if he looked sane, I think a lot of people just wanted to basically throw him back in there and forget about the whole thing. Hmm. Wow. But yeah, it's easy to call him. I mean, yeah, I I think absolutely he was mentally ill. I mean, schizophrenia is a very serious thing. Mm -hmm. And you know, especially if you don't know that. <laughs> if you don't, you know, who who was he talking to all this time? His mother, and pretty much that was it, right? So it's yep. not. So it's not like he could go, you know, like, do you see that person over there? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And during his formative years, when he and Henry were in school, um, if they would try to socialize and befriend any of the children that they went to school with, Augusta would put a quick stop to that. That was literally the only reason that she would allow the boys to leave the farm for any time at all was school. Wow. So, yeah, I mean, that had been a factor in Gein's psychology for a long time. Also kind of makes you wonder if maybe 
Robert Block, who wrote the um, Psycho novel, wasn't taking that many liberties, actually, when he described the um, scenes that the movie shows where they hear the dead Mrs. Bates talking, but it's really Norman, uh, you know? Well, you know, he act, you know, being schizophrenic, he could have very well conjured up, uh, you know, mm -hmm. a completely real version of her after her death. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Complete with auditory hallucinations and everything. Right. But I think it's also important for people to realize who maybe aren't as familiar with schizophrenia that most schizophrenics are not violent at all. No, not at all. Well, so, be Beautiful Mind, there's a good example. Yeah, John Nash right. would be an excellent one. So Gein is also an outlier in terms of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and, and here we go. Uh, you know, they both, these two guys both had the same, uh, mental illness, but look at the role environment played on shaping who they became. One be became a brilliant mathematician. One mm -hmm. became, a, a even more famous for the gruesomeness of his crimes. Yep. Oh, absolutely. And it was the mother that made all the <laughs> difference. Yep. Because, um, yeah, I've, I got to say, I got uh, <laughs> my own mother, who was a uh, narcissistic sociopath. Um, mm-hmm. Not to the extent that Gein's mother was, by any stretch, but certainly had a, a more than a few similarities. It's a little surprising. Just, you know, same quality, different quantities, I would guess you, you could say it. Yeah, and definitely. So, you know, when I hear the kinds of things that she did... I'm like, yeah, I got a taste of that, <laughs> man. You know, and it's if you, you know, my mo she tried to get the same kinds of hooks into my brain and my siblings, and mm. but n not as ruthless about it. Well, I mean, was she as religious as Augusta? If I may ask, or... um, I again, I would say she, she was pretty religious, yeah, but mm -hmm. it was more about, um, to, fr from my experience, I would say that religion served as a um, backup authority, you know, an author a, you know, so she could call on the authority of the church to um, enforce her will in mm -hmm. the home, right? Mm. Wow. Um, but also some of the, a, a little bit of the similar things where, you know, uh, that, uh, you know, sex is bad. Uh, only boys want sex. You know, if a girl has, mm -hmm. if a if girl girls have sex, it's because they're coerced, mm. right? Yeah, or that kind of shit. A typical kind of controlling garbage. It's all, it's all about control, absolutely. Yeah, but she yeah. never she never tried tried to keep us in the house because she was also uh, bipolar and she wanted. <laughs> kids out of the house as much as possible <laughs> mm. so she could go in her room and close the door in her uh, depressive state I wonder if Augusta was would have had some sort of disorder some personality disorder maybe yeah. if anybody's ever tried to diagnose that from what people know what the record is you know, I I haven't heard, um, but 
that kind of controlling it sounds a lot like um uh, crap now i can't think of the word um mm -hmm. borderline personality yep, no, absolutely it could have been i was also wondering about that schizophrenia connection if maybe that's it wasn't hereditary, some sort of isn't a, it? exactly yeah Definitely. Um, and that would, uh, uh, I think that I think that plenty of deeply religious people throughout history, you know, famously religious people, I mean, have mm -hmm. been schizophrenic and um, have mis n not knowing that they have a mental illness. I mean, how would you know? Like if right if you're if it's like the eighth seventeenth century, or mm -hmm. and you're seeing the people and demons and shit, how would you mm -hmm. know that you're not like anybody else, right? How would you? Yeah, know? how would I mean? Your first thought in a lot of places might be that you're possessed, right? Would Go you... to your priest, yeah. If you dared to say anything, right? Because yeah, a lot of those people ended up, uh, you know, on the barbecue. Yep. So you Absolutely. might you might not want to say anything about it, and you might turn to religion, you know, as a defense. Mm hmm So so it's it's not unthinkable that you know that Augusta had demonic visions as part of a of her of schizophrenia and that's kind of what drove her to you know want to keep the the boys on the farm literally oh yeah it, it definitely could have been i mean of course there would be no way to really diagnose it but i was just wondering if anybody who was a shrink might have Lended an opinion there. Yeah, I don't know. Got a source here from the Department of Psychology at Radford University. But it looks like it might be just a timeline. Interesting, nonetheless, though. I'll put it in the chat. Ah, man. And yeah, so so whatever happened to I mean all of those body mm -hmm. part, all of those artifacts, I guess you would call them. I would think most of them ended up at the Wisconsin State Crime Lab and might still be in an evidence locker. Because there's no real way to tell a lot of them apart. Yeah. And did he ever? Did he ever admit to any of them? Um, he did to the two murders. So he said it was just. Yeah. The, he said it was just the two that he killed, and everybody else was grave robbed. Is that right? Yeah. That that is what he said. But there was. Um, Two hunters who had disappeared some years before they caught him. And then there was, I think, two other um, girls around the late teens, late teens in age, who also disappeared in Wisconsin, that they tried to blame it on him. But he said no, that he had nothing to do with any of that. Yeah, it's, it's hard to know how to take that kind of stuff because, you know... Uh... Just because, I mean, we we we've, we've seen this before, right? Where a, a a killer will be okay with confessing to some crimes, but not others, even though there's strong evidence that they d committed those crimes. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. It. You know, with Gein, though, I think it's interesting. He wasn't exactly a guy who was prone to lying. In fact, I think it would have violated, it, to some degree, the moral code that he had ruthlessly beat into him by Augusta. Right. So 
you know, honestly, those other murders, I wouldn't be surprised if he wasn't connected. Because they also happened way before he started robbing graves. Ah. Uh. You know, it just, it wouldn't fit that line of development. It wouldn't fit that evolution. And and how far afield were they? I mean, he was, he had a car, but he didn't travel, right? And he really didn't. I mean, he would essentially just go into town for supplies as he would need it. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure that they were kind of scattered over the state, those other ones. Um. You know, it's probably just a case where, oh, we found a freak, let's blame this other stuff on him, too. True. Because it's convenient to wrap it all up in a pretty little bow. Right. Which brings up an interesting thing about uh, police and district attorneys. So so there's a there's an interesting TED Talk where somebody... This one psychologist was talking about these two different mentalities, and mm-hmm. and she, she used the metaphor of uh, an army, mm-hmm. and she said, you know, one mentality is the soldier, and the soldier is out to get a result. Mm-hmm. Oh, you know, definitely, right? Yeah, yeah the, and and that's how cops typically are. But the other mentality is what she calls the scout. And the scout is out looking for information. Mm -hmm. They don't have a vested interest in an outcome. Mm -hmm. They're just gathering data. They're just looking for what's going on. What's the reality? Uh Uh-huh. And the, the problem that I see with so many police and district attorneys is they just don't have that scout mentality. They want to arrest somebody and put some fucker in jail. And they're uh-huh. and they're not they just don't often enough have that scout mentality, that curiosity, that looking for you know, the reality, the right information, putting the right person in jail. They just mm-hmm. want they just want to get a fucking result. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it almost kind of relates to the um, detective's curse, as it's been called. Myopia. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Um, and, and which is how you end up with these false confessions. Mm-hmm. Because the police are so, you know, they've already decided they don't, they're not you know, they don't do these interrogations to get information. They get do these interrogations to get confessions. And so, oh, exactly. And so they, you know, hopefully it's less of a thing now, but it's, you don't have to go very far back in history to find these cases of interrogations where they just beat, mentally break down a suspect until they sometimes actually start to believe they committed these crimes. Oh, I definitely believe it. You don't even have to go that far back to find a um, infamous example. And you've seen Making a Murderer, haven't you? Yeah. That is definitely false confession with Brendan Dassey. And another case from the great dead heart of Wisconsin, too. And uh, uh, John Grisham's Innocent Man... um, which is, mm-hmm. a, is another series that's out currently, and same hmm. same kind of thing. And then there was a um, lesser known case in San Diego, where these uh, I'm trying to remember three or four young sailors were rounded up and interrogated for the murder of their neighbor, a woman who was lived a few doors down. Mm-hmm. And they were subjected to the same kinds of things and wrongly convicted uh, in spite of evidence, but they were convicted on the strength of their confessions mm-hmm. to the point that when 
uh, you know, many, many years later, DNA evidence proved them innocent, some of them still thought they did it. Wow. Man. It's just, it's amazing. Yeah. The psychology of all that definitely needs to be studied more as to the interrogation techniques that produce it. Absolutely. I think that's criminal. I do too. I definitely do. Of course, you look at it with like Brendan Dassey, there wasn't even a lawyer in the room when they were doing it. There wasn't even a parent in the room. Right. Well, he was a minor. So often is the case. Mm -hmm. An attorney wouldn't put up with that shit for, you know, 18, 20, 24 hours straight, 36 hours straight. Oh, yeah, not at all. And, of course, you know, it's easy to keep a kid in the dark about their rights. Hell, it's easy to keep a lot of adults in the dark about their rights to have an attorney present when they're questioned. Right. It's just, yeah, I think it's utterly wrong what happened to Dassey with that. Exactly. I do, too. Criminal. I do, too. Well, and there's a lot of evidence that he was set up to cover up other crimes. Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Other crimes and bureaucratic ineptitude in um, that part of Wisconsin. I, you know, so those listening in, if the police ever want to talk to you, even though they will start off saying, hey, can you help us out with this? You know, they'll they'll often treat you like a witness when you're actually a suspect at the mm-hmm. beginning, and, and that's to put you at ease. Oh and, yeah. And even if they ask you to sit down and talk to them as a witness, there is only one word to say. Attorney. Lawyer. Yep. <laughs> and you say one word and shut the fuck up. <laughs> mm-hmm. They have to respect that. Yep. And, you know, that's the other thing that I think a lot of people in the culture at large don't realize. While you are not legally allowed to lie to police, police are legally allowed to lie to you yes. in, the ca- in the course of interrogation. Yes, and they will. Yeah, they absolutely will. To get things like a quicker slam dunk on their case. That's not to say that all cops are bad or anything. No, I mean, we obviously they're, don't believe that. They're but... taught, but they're taught to do that. Oh, exactly. It's the way that they are trained. And it's and it goes back to what I was saying that, um, you know, they're they're out for a result. Their mm-hmm. their career advancement their prospects for ex- advancement are based on convictions not the not... <laughs> the photo that was up just before that black and white one was augusta yeah mr dead man asked and i told him i pointed out so sorry to cut you off there no that's all right but the the incentives for the criminal justice system is set up to reward convictions Right, right, and by its very nature, it's adversarial. Yeah, it's not. It's not really a justice system. It's a conviction system. Mm-hmm. They don't care what the. They don't give a fuck what is right. They need numbers. Oh, exactly. And even when you get into things like prosecutors making deals, it a lot of it goes back to numbers. But the other interesting thing with that is that without deals, the system would actually collapse pretty fast. Oh, I understand. Because there would be such a backlog. But I understand. But they. Yeah. On the one hand, yes, you know, if you can if you can make a deal, and that uh, saves everybody time and hassle, and get you and achieve essentially the same outcome as a trial yep. that makes that makes sense what doesn't make i mean what where it goes awry is where prosecutors use the threat of a trial to get a deal mm-hmm. and get people to con, to agree to a deal 
um, whether they did it or not. Yeah, oh, exactly. I mean, I couldn't agree more. And then the other part of that, when they start stacking charges on right. to remove, you know, to say, okay, you plead guilty to this and we won't go to trial for this. Yeah. All yeah. about padding their win column. It's all about the numbers. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I, I think that is a perverse incentive. Oh, I agree. It, it certainly is. I mean, you also see with a lot of them anymore um, dragging their feet on giving evidence to um, that might giving potentially exculpatory evidence to the defense. There was a um, case that was actually related to Kamala Harris, and I, not getting political here, but she was the AG in California, and there was a guy who was charged with, I believe it was sexual abuse, and then they later found out that he was not guilty, basically, because of DNA and this exculpatory evidence, and they found out that the prosecutor's office had withheld it right. before the trial. Yeah. And it, and Harris's office stood by this prosecutor who did that. Well, and she hasn't really set that right. You know, be, it's it's that's a that is a direct consequence of the way the incentives are set up. Oh yeah. You know, it it's it makes people, you know, take shortcuts. You know, oh, it absolutely. Makes, it in, it incentivizes uh, corruption. And Mr. Deadman says Kamala Harris never will. I agree. No matter the amount of pressure that's being put on her by her base and civil libertarians, she's not going to crack on that no. and admit she was wrong. No. Yep, not at all. It was just Oh yeah, a, there's one of the ashtrays that Gene made out of a skull. Yeah. <laughs> he also made um bowls out of the tops of skulls. And why not? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's interesting and it almost makes me wonder if it doesn't reflect the hunting ethos. It's also very common down here where there's also a lot of deer hunting. Mm -hmm. I'm in Illinois. In fact, the county right below me is the most populous for deer in a um, good section of the world. We get a lot of people around here hunting white-tailed deer. Mm -hmm. And it's a big part of the ethos to try to use as much of the animal as you can. Right, right, yeah. Um, game hunting is, you know, I'm out here in the West. It's a, it's a big deal. Well, it's a big part of the culture everywhere but a few places in the country mm -hmm. it's much more uh it's easier to name the places in the country where it's not a part of the culture oh yeah it's a couple yeah, of cities, a agree. few cities on the coast pretty much i do think that it's the city people who come in for a weekend warrior style hunting who don't get that whole idea of using the whole animal though it tends to be you know more rural people no matter where the rural people mm -hmm. are located mm -hmm. i think absolutely but, um you know rural rural people whether they actually live on a farm or a ranch they're around it mm -hmm. and so they are you know um seeped in that steeped in that uh, that culture and they yeah. underst they understand it. They respect the weapons. They they understand the the um, mm -hmm. you know uh, it's a uh, yeah it's it's the city yeah the city slickers <laughs> you know they're yeah. the ones they're the ones that are more likely to go out and shoot a cow instead of a deer. <laughs> yeah yeah they're the ones who are you know it really gets back to a culture of. Um, waste not want not in the rural areas you know I said rural <laughs> <laughs> definitely 
Deadman's trying to find a word that I can't pronounce right. <laughs> <laughs> Would Ed Gein make a good dictator? Huh. Um, <laughs> no. Yeah, I'm going with a no on that as well. For one He'd be thing, too disorganized. He's disorganized. He's a complete introvert. Yep. He's schizophrenic. Yep. Um. <laughs> and Bundy absolutely would make a good dictator. Absolutely. He was uh, right in the uh, Jim Jones. You know, he, yep. Jim Jones was a dictator, just not of a country, just over his congregation. Yep. Well, he was trying to make it into a country. Right. Definitely. But yeah, little diminutive Ed Gein. Nah, he wouldn't nope. make a good dictator. No, nobody would follow him anywhere. Nope. Yeah. He, he, you you got to be a sociopath to be a dictator, but you also have to have some charisma. Yeah, yeah, very true. Very, very true. And you have to also, I think, preferably not have a thought disorder like schizophrenia. Yeah, uh, I'm trying real hard to not to get into the, <laughs> the religious uh, possibilities but, uh, where schizophrenia might have played a role um, because it's, yeah. it's kind of speculative <laughs> oh it definitely does i was looking into some of that with that piece that i wrote on the doppelganger for jordan peele's new movie especially on temporal lobe epilepsy and religious visions ah like uh joan of arc yep joan of arc would be one several others they actually did a study i believe it was on the carmelite nuns and temporal lobe activity with their religious visions. But, yeah, that's where I... Us. Oh, Us. Um, yeah, Us, Jordan Peele's movie. There's the link for anybody who's interested. Yeah, yeah, I've seen that. Uh, I've seen the trailers for that coming up. It's not at all clear from the trailers that it has to do with doppelgangers. Well, and that was um, me reading the other information that I was getting with oh, it, too. Right. Well, you knew you did an interview, right? Oh, no, it wasn't an interview on us. Oh, you haven't done one on that? No, I was just okay. giving people a historic and scientific look at the doppelganger and how it relates to things, but like the publicity info that I get sent on the movie. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, what I'm saying is the trailer doesn't give away that it's a doppelganger uh, family, a whole family. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it really doesn't, yeah, but... It doesn't give away a lot, actually. No. No, he's got to keep some cards up his sleeve most definitely but that's a good thing yeah you know yeah uh, i mean it does i mean one of my pet peeves about trailers is that getting through the end of the trailer going well i don't have to watch that movie <laughs> oh yeah i know everything that's gonna happen definitely and he uh, peel to his credit i think always makes very excellent trailers like, have you seen the ones for um, his reboot of The Twilight Zone? No. It's going to be very good when it comes out on CBS All Access. That April is, 1. I got to say, that's ballsy. Yeah. I, that, to even consider doing a remake of Twilight Zone, that is ballsy because that is you know almost that is a revered show oh yeah yeah it, you I would mean, say it, it's almost not just, untouchable yeah it is not just popular it is canonical <laughs> mm -hmm. and, yeah it really is um 
so to even consider that they, they must they must have some really good idea of what the fuck they're doing so that's interesting yeah yeah, most definitely. I put the link out for one of those, too, in the chat. Will the kids these days even bother with it? Uh, the Twilight. Twilight Zone? Sure. I think so, too. I think, you know, the great thing about the Twi Twilight Zone is it wasn't just one kind of story, right? Yeah, and it's anthology. Well, it was a nice, definition. It was an anthology, but there wasn't. It wasn't just like sci-fi stories. Um, mm -hmm. It was just weird shit. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, but it almost always had a social component to it too. Right. You right. know, there was just there was, a, just like what Jordan Peele did with Get Out. Yeah, there's all there was always a little bit of a lesson ab about it. Um, uh, you know. I mean, one of the ones that I remember from as a kid watching was the there was this um, family in a, a covered wagon out in the like the California desert, and they were all by themselves, and they got stuck or stranded somehow. And mm -hmm. the, the father decides he's gonna go for help, and he goes over this hill, and there's a gas station. <laughs> mm -hmm. And he oh, just wow. right, he just he just jumped like a hundred years. <laughs> Yep. And, you know, Definitely. So, so what is that, right? <laughs> this, <laughs> what kind of story is that? Is that sci-fi? Uh, you know, not really. Yeah. <laughs> it definitely blurs the genre lines. Yeah, and that's the kind of shit that, you know, is, um, is interesting as a viewer because you don't know what the hell's going to happen. Mm-hmm. But you know something will. <laughs> oh yeah. And it's yeah, not, and, it, and it's not cheap scares either. Oh no, no, it's all very well written. And Rod, definitely, did, Rod Serling, he like wrote all of that, right? He did. That's astonishing, because there's a fuckload of episodes. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, how many years is that on for? I don't know, but there's over, there's I don't know, a couple of hundred episodes. To think about that, think about that. This guy wrote all of that. One guy. Oh yeah. It's astonishing to even consider that today. I was just looking that up while we're talking. 1959 to 1964 was his incarnation of it. Rod wow. Serling's. Oh, so only six years worth of episodes every week? Oh, oh yeah. I mean, there's a lot. But wasn't there a second incarnation after that? Hmm. I thought there was. Maybe yeah. not. Maybe not. I don't think so. I think they did, uh, you know, um, variations on that. There was, um, I can't really even remember. Uh-huh. Um. And I was just looking to see who's credited as a writer on it. Yeah, that's... Oh, they only have one episode credited so far, but... Of the new I think, one? Yeah, it's um, Alex Rubens is credited for the new one. Although Rod Serling is credited for the original stories on the new one. Oh, I wonder if that's what they're doing, is just remaking the old stories. It might be. The um, link that I put out there is a lot of the um, footage for this trailer was taken from their episode called Nightmare at 30,000 Feet. Oh. Which is, is a remake of Nightmare at 20,000 Feet. Which, wasn't that the one with... Uh, Shatner. Shatner, right? Yep. We're seeing the monster on the wing and shit. Yep. They have um, Adam Scott in that new one. Okay. Might be good. I don't mind him. Yeah. But, yeah, I think Jordan Peele is the man to definitely spearhead that. And he's a, just think of the balls it took to switch from comedy to something like Get Out. <laughs> 
you know that's literally unprecedented what he did with that uh that you know uh, i gotta say most people that i know that have a great really great sense of humor it was dev- that was honed against some really dark rocks <laughs> oh yeah i mean absolutely but you didn't it's not something that you would see in hollywood that often for a comedic director to switch right over to horror for oh, a true feature yeah, film yeah they're really great at pigeonholing yeah yeah, typecasting a director just like you typecast an actor. Absolutely. Basically. Because they have no fucking imagination. <laughs> no. For, for a creative industry, they have a shockingly minute amount of creativity. And none in the executive suites. Oh, I couldn't agree more. And just looking at Jordan Peele's IMDb page, it is actually his 40th birthday today. Happy birthday! Happy birthday, Mr. Peele, indeed. So do the um, people who work for him, are they peelers? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> you know, that's, really? you know where that, that's where that term came from, right? So pe- really? peelers are, you know, it's a slang for a cop in 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 England, right? Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Interesting. It came, it came from the first uh, police chief in London, Robert Peel. Oh. Huh. So wow. the cops were peelers, and then they and they were they were called cops because of the buttons, right? The copper buttons. Yeah. Yep, that I did know. Now, honestly, when you said peelers, it made me think of my um, late grandfather. We would always give him shit because he was in the Navy. We'd say, what'd you do, just peel potatoes? (laughs) So. (laughs) Yeah. My dad called it being on KP duty. (laughs) (laughs) Yep. We, we we, We got that plenty. Oh, yeah. Yep. Well, what else is, is there anything left to to banter about with uh, this creepy man? No, I think we kind of beat the hell out of Mr. Gein. Yeah, he was a uh... <laughs> you know, I, I, I get this impression that you know, people in this little town and they see this creepy little guy, you know, every, mm-hmm. you know, all the time. And if you were to ask any of them, who's, who from this town is going to be world famous? Nobody nope. would pick him. <laughs> nope. Nope, they wouldn't, man. You know, it just made me think, because he does look like a little ghoul. In a lot of those pictures. Yeah. I mean, one of the monikers that they used was the ghoul of Plainfield, but also the um, butcher of Plainfield. Um, but it just it made me think of that. Another movie that he actually helped inspire that's a little bit lesser known than the ones we were discussing yeah. is 1967's It. It's about um, the tale of a golem, basically. Really? Yeah. I don't know that one. I was just going to bring that up, too. See, so inspired quite a bit of that as well. If I can find the link. One of the things I think that happens with, um, you know, You sit down as a writer, you sit down and you go, what could you write about? You know, Mm -hmm. you know, what kind of crazy shit can you write about and have people, you know, buy into it? And um, I think it was I think it was um, Tom Clancy who said, you know, the difference between fiction and nonfiction is that nonfiction has to be believable. 
Mm -hmm. And what, oddly enough, one of the things that these monsters do is they expand the envelope of what we will believe is true. Oh, yeah. Like I mean, before, they definitely do. Before Ed Gein, if you had written about a fictional account of the kind of shit that he did, it would have been dismissed out of hand as not possible. Mm -hmm. you know? But it took a real life monster like Ed to show that, nope, <laughs> what <laughs> you think is possible is far too limited. Yep. It definitely moves those goalposts for what we call reality. Yeah. Definitely. And and then and then somebody you know, then another guy comes along, you know. There's the mm -hmm. the more the people out on the, the two the couple out in uh, Manchester who murdered children. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, there's Fred and Rose, the couple who, who abducted and murdered people. You know, it just goes on and on and on. You know, oh, that couldn't happen. Well, then it does. <laughs> yep. And, um, you know, it, yeah, I was just watching a thing about the, that couple in Manchester. And, you know, they would just abduct children right out of town. Wow. And take now that up. would take some balls. Yeah. They just convince them to get in the car with them, take them out to the moors, and rape and murder them. Wow. And leave Man. and bury them out there. Many yeah. of whom they can't even find their bodies anymore. Damn. Sure. So, you know, yeah. It's it's just, ugh. You, you, and and you know and Bundy Bundy changed this whole region where I'm from. Mm -hmm. You know it literally, you know in the course of, uh, like a couple of months, just wiped out the innocence of this whole this whole state. Um. Or, you know, it was okay. yesterday it was okay to leave your door unlocked or walk around at night, and now mm -hmm. it's not. And now it's not. Oh, yeah. And before they caught him, you know, the yeah. monster didn't have a face. And after they catch him, they realize, hey, maybe the monster doesn't look so monstrous. Yeah. And I think that scares the hell out of people, too. Exactly. With people like him. I think I think that freaked out a lot of people that he was just a just a guy, and and a and a seemingly nice guy. Oh yeah, definitely. Okay. Yep, I think we have beat him to death and then some. I would definitely agree. Dug All up right. his body and then beat him again. <laughs> <laughs> Now, we're, next week we have a special show, do we not? We do. We will be talking about the Velisca Axe murders with um, a filmmaker, friend of mine, who is coming on. And we might also be getting into the theory of the serial killer who might be behind more murders than just that one. Oh, so. oh really? Oh, yeah. The Midwestern Axe Man is the name of the theory. Ooh. So, <laughs> uh, I'm intrigued. Most definitely. It's one of those cases that the more you look at it, the more questions you have. Oh, well. <laughs> uh, yeah, I like that. Yep. Yeah. It definitely. An open and shut case. What's to talk about? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How can, yep. you, how can you have a conspiracy like that? <laughs> now, crime that was so brutal, it literally knocked the Titanic off the front page of many newspapers in America. Jeez. So it happened not long after it in 1912. Wow. So that is what we will be getting into with our special guest. 
Awesome. Looking forward to that next week. Be Me sure, too. Be sure and tune in, everybody, and have a good old listen. Yep. Have a great night and steer clear of the monsters. <laughs> if you can. <laughs> <laughs> yep. With that caveat, if you can. Good night. Good night. <laughs>